Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons over on Patreon voted for me to animate the Battle of Shepherdstown. If you'd like to vote for the next animation, please go to the Patreon page and join for as little as $1, and you can cast your ballot. When Robert E. Lee's army got stopped by George McClellan's Army of the Potomac at the Battle of Antietam, the Confederate Army began its march back to Virginia by venturing across the Potomac River. Near Shepherdstown, at Bottler's Ford or Blackford's Ford, Brigadier General William Pendleton was tasked with guarding the ford to prevent the Union Army from attacking the rear columns of the Army of Northern Virginia. Pendleton commanded 33 artillery pieces and two brigades of infantry numbering around 600 men combined. Colonel John Lamar commanded Marcellus Douglas's brigade after Douglas was killed at Antietam, and Colonel James Hodges was acting as commander of a brigade since their actual commander, Brigadier General Louis Armistead, was acting as provost guard for Lee and had been wounded earlier as well. Pendleton deployed 15 guns below the fort and 18 above the fort, with the infantry guarding the banks against a possible crossing under orders to conserve ammunition. On September 19th, Federal cavalry, along with five artillery batteries, took up a position on the bluffs across the Potomac River, and a heated exchange of artillery erupted between the two opposing sides. The V Corps under Major General Fitzjohn Porter, having only been lightly engaged at Antietam, arrived on the field. The Corps' artillery batteries deployed across from the Confederates and sharpshooters from the 1st U.S. Sharpshooters and the 2nd Company of Massachusetts Sharpshooters, also called 2nd Andrews Sharpshooters, lined the riverbank, taking careful aim at the great enemy on the other side. Although the Confederates were sparing with their ammunition, both infantry and artillery were running low on rounds. Some batteries had to just stop firing. Porter sent the 4th Michigan of Brigadier General Charles Griffin's brigade to the ford, along with the 5th and 10th New York Infantry of Colonel Governor Warren's brigade. Late in the day, Pendleton noticed that the Union artillery were firing at a faster rate and the infantry were noticeably firing more rounds. The rapid rate of fire was in preparation for the infantry to cross the river. The meager Confederate force was no match for the Union regiments preparing to cross, so bands of rebel infantry and artillery began to pull away from the riverbank. Pendleton allegedly left the field, abandoning his men and the position. Porter ordered the 4th Michigan and the 1st U.S. sharpshooters to cross, but the Michiganders did not find the ford, and when they plunged into the water, it was up to their necks, soaking their cartridge boxes, rifles, and gear. The sharpshooters found the ford and crossed relatively dry. When they made it to the other side, they found few defenders. All but four pieces of artillery escaped the clutches of the Union infantry, but one artillery piece had a special meaning to Brigadier General Charles Griffin, because it was one of the cannons that he had lost at the Battle of First Manassas when he was commander of the West Point Battery, officially called the 5th U.S. Artillery Battery D. Pendleton raced to try to find General Longstreet, but was unsuccessful in the dark, but he did find Lee's headquarters about midnight. Pendleton reported to the Army commander that he had lost all of the reserve artillery. All, Lee asked? Yes, General, I fear all, Pendleton replied. Lee concluded that there could be nothing done until the morning. But Stonewall Jackson wouldn't hear of it. When he got word that all of the Army of Northern Virginia's reserve artillery was captured, he began assembling three divisions to march on Blackford's Ford. At 6.30 a.m. on September 20th, A.P. Hill's men proceeded to the Ford. Jackson personally rode ahead of his columns alone to reconnoiter the ground, when Lee awoke that morning, he found that half of his army was gone. Jackson hadn't shared his plans with the commander. Within the Union Army, McClellan sent Porter orders the night before about how to proceed the next day. He stated, push your command forward after the enemy as rapidly as possible, using your artillery upon them wherever an opportunity presents, doing them all the damage in your power without incurring too much risk to your command. If great results can be obtained, do not spare your men or horses. By that morning, Griffin's brigade had been replaced by the brigades of Charles Lovell and James Barnes. About a mile from the ford, Jackson spied Federal forces, so he raced back to Hill's men and deployed the divisions in two lines, Pender, Gregg, and Thomas in the front, and Brock and Brawl Lane and Archer behind. The two sides clashed on the undulating terrain just south of the river. Hill's men came under a murderous artillery barrage from the Union gunners across the Potomac, but when the Confederates got close to the Union lines, Federal soldiers began feeling the impact of friendly fire. Warren's small two-regiment brigade deployed on Lovell's left as the Confederates came up to deliver volleys into the Blue ranks. 
Barnes's men advanced onto the ridge and exchanged blows with Hill's front line, but the Mountain Confederate numbers were becoming a problem. Additionally, the Green 118th Pennsylvania had yet to shoot their newly acquired infield rifles. The Pennsylvanians raised their weapons to their shoulders and pulled the triggers to find that many were defective. Slowly, the regiments began to file across the ford from Lovell and Warren's brigades, and when the Confederates mounted the bluffs to shoot the crossing blue troops, Union gunners sent a barrage into their ranks, backing them away and saving the routing Union columns. On the Union right, Barnes ordered his men to fall back, with some taking the ford and others crossing over the dam. However, the 118th Pennsylvania stayed put. Barnes's aide could not find the commander of the 118th, so he told the first officer he saw to withdraw. The lieutenant then found his colonel and told him the order. Colonel Prevost stated that he did not take orders that way, and if the order was to be followed, the aide needed to tell him directly. Hill's men descended upon the 118th. The only thing saving them was their large size. Its newly mustered ranks numbered about 800 men. When their colonel was shot in the shoulder and their brigade commander finally made it to their lines, Barnes ordered them to cross the river, which they did, but many would be captured. As both armies settled into their respective sides of the river, the Maryland campaign came to a close.